So good morning and welcome to episode four now of our uh, Fireside Chat. I'm joined today by uh, a small portion of our audience uh, today. This is the smallest session we've had, so uh, hopefully we'll get some good one-on-one -on -one time. But I'm joined today by uh, Aidan Shanahan uh, from Govia Thameslink and Dave Maskell uh, from Thatcher Research. So guys, thank you again, as always, for joining. I'll read away. <laughs> Um, so, so the, top, the topic today is quite. We, we might go quite technical today, as we've got a, um, a small audience. But the um, one of the things that we have seen a lot over the last twelve months is, is of course, the huge shift and pace of migration into in, into Microsoft 365 in particular. Um, so, we've personally been involved in I'm on lose track of how many projects now, but but really trying to help those organisations get rid of the final remnants of what they've got on premises into into cloud, really, so that people can work and and and, and collaborate from anywhere. Um, and as we kind of know at the beginning of the pandemic, you know that everything was kind of done as a, a as an urgency basis, right? And and for many organisations, they haven't really uh, had the time to plan how that was going to work. Um, and, and almost to take care of some of the stuff that has to happen un, under the waterline um, to ensure they can protect data and, and, and look after the users and those kind of things. So we've, we've started to see um, really in the last like, three or four months a real shift in questions, I guess, around you know what, what level of protection do I actually have across my, my environment, you know, what does my licensing entitle me to do? How can I ensure that I can protect data, understand what my users are doing, provide them with a mechanism to recover things if they delete them accidentally? Um, what happens if somebody does something malicious? What happens if somebody does something wrong? Um, and you know, how do I ensure that I'm compliant right, against all the all, all the regulatory um, policies and procedures that I need to be relevant to? So, so we thought today it would be. Um, an interesting topic to talk about, you know, the tools that are there within Office 365. So what can we do? Um, how should we be configuring the environment to uh, to best protect our data, whether that's against, um, you know, theft, ransomware, accidental deletion, those kind of things, um, versus, um, you know, backup, right? So the traditional ways that, you know, when we were all on premises and we had file servers and application servers, then it was a relatively straightforward approach, right? We had backup software. We backed up our files. We used differential backups we backed up to disk or tape or, or whatever whatever we did in the day um more recently you know um, into cloud services um but what's the right blend of those things to have because you can spend money on compliance solutions you can spend money on configuring uh all the wealth of services that 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 sit within the office versus five stack depending on of course your your license entitlement um or you can you know do traditionally what organizations have done um, and wrapped everything up with a, you know, with, with backup almost as, as an insurance policy on your information. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to cover today. Um, I think there'll be a bit of a mixed view. Um, as always, welcome your comments um, in the in the live chat. Um, so, Aidan, I'm going to hand over to you and ask you that question. So, you know, prior to um, Govia migrating, you know, in Mass to Office 365, how how did you used to? protect data and how would that change um of like um uh, and i hope you can all hear me um i suppose uh, yeah you look back and you kind of go sort of back back five or ten years and it kind of it was the disk to disk to tape or it was the disk to disk to cloud if you had fast enough pipes and kind of it was very much that model of did you have, and, and tape or cloud was very much kind of either auto loaders or, or did you have a, a, the wherewithal to pull it back centrally and could you trust someone to take the tapes out was the big question. It was, it was, uh, it was very much on premise and it was kind of, then you had the joys of volume shadow copy service coming along and suddenly you kind of go, well, okay, I might not have to pull the tapes out or um, I might have a disk library in between, so I'll pull a copy back off first. Um, I think most organizations probably when they hit 365, Go email first because it tended to be the big sort of the big selling point of the licensing was kind of like great I can um, decommission my own premise exchange farm and suddenly I'm not reliant on local pipes and um, then you are kind of handing over that responsibility to Microsoft almost to kind of say have you got a copy of it and 
then you're into the territory of sort of retention policies and things like that. To sort of say, how long are you going to keep a policy, keep a copy of um, data after someone leaves, for example, uh, or litigation hold has been the main sort of tools behind it. Um, I think we, we it's probably not really pandemic related to be honest, but we, we we are looking at sort of file servers and decommissioning on-premise physical kit as it comes to end of life and moving that to sort of storage to either SharePoint or or new redundant sort of storage and data centers instead. Um, as part of that journey, I think the thing you will always hit is kind of well, what is it? What are you backing up and what you present? What are you backing up or protecting and what are you protecting against? Because it's very different requirements. It's kind of if it's a user's data, then yes, you've got all the sort of um, the benefits of sort of saying it's probably not going to be a weird, a wonderful file type. You can put it in OneDrive or SharePoint and away off it goes into the cloud and you can start using the sort of the 365 protection tools, whether it's conditional access, multi factor authentication, or however you choose to sort of implement some of the different licensing features to protect yourself as the main feature of securing it externally and then you're into kind of the the cloud recycle bins for kind of the the old equivalent of volume shadow copy service of oh i've accidentally deleted that well so long as so long as people are behaving in the way you would hope they're behaving and they haven't sort of i suppose for want of a better word deleted it at too high a level then you're usually going to be able to get something back um the issues we kind of had to sort of review and go through with users were very much around well what happens if the team or the site gets deleted because it's a bit of a different territory then to the individual file. Um, also, I mean, if you're looking at sort of the modern world, it's kind of it's not just the accidental deletions, is it? It's the it's the ransomware. It's the um, the joys of the uh, malicious IT team member who, who may be leaving, or kind of um, even just kind of uh, someone's compromised an IT account and is is going out to sort of do harm to you these days internally to sort of disrupt your business and i think those those priorities can be very different to the data protection um and data sort of um compliance requirements because you kind of go certain parts of our service would be still run on on-premise for on-premise servers and applications and kind of we'd have very different requirements about protecting them and sort of keeping them up than we would do kind of one individual user's data um because one would likely not stop a train service running one would uh, or would cause, or would cause major, major disruption. So I think it's always going to be a tiered model of what you protect and how and where it is really. Um, with 365, when we started looking at sort of um, SharePoint and um, OneDrive en, en masse, I suppose, um, then we did start looking at sort of third party services as well at that time. So there is the um, totally separate copy somewhere else. Um, you do then get down to the kind of, well, how frequent is that? Because <laughs> it's the, the old uh, recovery point or recovery time objectives as to kind of what, if the worst happens, how long would it take you to get it back? But I think a lot of that was more around awareness and uh, I suppose consideration against third party risk rather than Microsoft risk. Um, so I suppose the third party backup piece of it more came in so from um, if it's totally gone for whatever reason, uh, then what can you do really? I don't know, um, Rob, Dave. I can say, Dave. I, I think you know there's some interesting points that 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 you've raised, and I think I think one of the things that comes out from that a lot is there's actually you know, there's, there's a lot of places now that data lives, right? The data has a lot of owners, right? You know, the world of the world of you know collaboration, and you, you talked about you know the the mass creation of team sites and share collaboration sites, we can share share files in Teams chat, we can collaborate in, in SharePoint, we can collaborate in Teams. Um, people still store stuff on their desktop that might be synchronized, but they still store stuff on desktops. Um, there's still traditional file servers out there. We've then got all the various range of controls that exist within um, Office 365. Aiden, you touched on a few. We have retention policies, we have data loss prevention, we have you know, just permissions and all the things that we used to kind of have. Um, Dave, do, do you think it's do you think it's quite easy to? You know, I mean, you, you look after a lot of very sensitive information. Do you, do you think it's easier or harder now to understand the the, the landscape, the, the the leakage possibility, the theft possibility, the stupidity possibility? Um, and to protect it, or is it harder now with all the range of tools and productivity that we have? I think in, in reality, Rob, it's, it's a bit of a mix. I think overarching, I would say it's harder. I think the 
the traditional approach that Aidan talked around, around, you know, all the data sitting on a file server, you replicate the file server with DFS technologies, you've got shadow copies, you've got tape backup, you've got cloud backup options, disk to disk to tape. Um, we, we all knew, everybody knew what the options were and what was available to them. Um, so if somebody inadvertently deleted a file, they know they'd go to shadow copies. Um, if it was longer than the time limit, they knew they would raise a ticket with IT, get a tape out, you know, do a cloud restore, um, all those options. I think now, because that whole uh, environment is blurred, because we, you know, we've seen Teams proliferation across the business, uh, you know, team creation, Microsoft made it very, very easy for lots of teams to be created. Um, and that understanding and knowledge of all the different recovery options is, is probably not there. And it's, uh, it's a risk. It's a risk we've had to manage within the organization uh, using various different tools from Microsoft and others um, to try and manage that. But it is very much more complicated. And for me, it's been a, uh, an education phase as much as anything else with our, with our users and our teams, understanding that, that responsibility model, that, that change from um, here's a file share that IT have provisioned and assigned group permissions to, to actually yeah. you're a team's owner, you own that responsibility and you're opening it up to the, you know, the approved external um, companies that we've uh, allowed, permitted, or you know, within the organization as well. So it, it has made it more difficult um but for good reasons and we can see the benefits of that as well it, but it is certainly a challenge at the moment for us so so, so so data governance and i guess protecting data becomes you know everybody's responsibility right and, and i think you know i think one of the things that you know reading between what you've said there is, is you're right you know it used to be you know in your personal life you were responsible for everything that you did and created and and, and everything else in work you weren't right you kind of came into this and you almost had this invisible shield around you where it created the resources you you purely access them or saved into the little buckets and the pockets that you're allowed to do and you know i remember you know going back years now in the days that i did it admin um where you know the the requests that you would get from my from from users were can you you know can you recover this file can you create me a folder can you change my password um can you work out why this file has disappeared that I was working on this morning? Honest, I haven't done anything with it. Um, I think it's very much now shifted to the how can I, you know, how do I create a team site? How do I collaborate on some documents? How do I change my password? Whatever that might be. So it, it, it does kind of beg that question back again. You know, we're giving, we're empowering our employees with the abilities to to do what they need to do at their fingertips without IT being a burden. And we're trusting our users, I guess, to determine whether something can be shared, uh, whether something can be accessed, whether, you know, what the life cycle of that um, file or record of a repository is that they're working on. Um, so therefore, how do we determine, um, you know, what the right tools are to use, um, what the policies are that we need to use? Because, it, of course, it's going to vary very much, isn't it, based on you know who the user is, what the data is, how it's classified, um, and of course what the you know what the the financial or reputational risk of that data is should it be leaked or or removed. Um, so, Aidan, I mean, how 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 have, how have you been addressing that, or how are you addressing that? Well, I think the tools the tools are less of an issue around the policies and governance, and actually sort of laying that understanding out clearly to the sort of the end user that if they create a file and put data in it, where they put it is their responsibility. And I, I do agree, it used to be kind of like, yeah, hey, you had your home drive for your H drive, use it for home drive, and that was your that was your personal document storage, and then whatever random letters of the rest of the alphabet uh, after, after C or D, which were assigned for different departmental drive file structures. Um, I think one of the big challenges of moving anything from a legacy infrastructure is already there to anywhere new is that um, moving the files is the easy bit, to be honest. It's the it's the actual going through and reviewing permissions and actually challenging sort of the different departments of actually, is this still relevant? Is this right? Is this kind of, have staff moved on? Has it changed? Or kind of, are they still in that role? Should they still have access to those files and folders? Um, and it, it's, I think that's the, that's the bigger ask, really. I mean, the tools you can sort of do the out of the box stuff for data loss prevention. So, depending pretty much whatever level your 365 licensing is, there's there's a component of DLP in there, and um, I think you can turn that on for the sort of the out of the box um, 
GDPR PII categories um, fairly fast. Um, I think you're into a territory of a, a wonderful territory of different license requirements. Then, if you sort of go down the road of, uh, are you going to even classify data? And if you are, how are you classifying? Is it manual or is it automatic? Um, and there's quite significant different license costs involved in that, and different, um, different, I suppose, different employee experiences, shall we say, as to kind of how how they expect to do that. And and you're into the territory. Of, are you going to classify every email and every uh, every document? Because if you aren't, then or how are you sort of picking stuff up in sort of Teams chat is the is the wonderful one sort of sort of broaching its its awareness at the moment really I suppose um, I think luckily a lot of our data is operational so there's much less of our sort of data which would fall into sort of the categories where we would need to sort of have either enhanced retention requirements or enhanced protection requirements because it's, it's quite a lot of it's quite a referral it's is this training train running well on this day kind of thing um, so I, I think tooling wise we've got a mix of out-of-the-box products and third-party products. Um, the out-of-the-box products is, is very much kind of focused around, more, it's more so around employee data and kind of, um, I suppose, employee personal data or departmental level data. It's kind of, a, we, we've got quite a bigger split, I suppose, between big operational systems, which would tend to remain on-premise in data centers and, and be very kind of, be focused and manufacturer supported almost rather than it being, um, a cloud service. If I look at our major sort of cloud requirements, it's kind of it's more the management and admin kind of see the things rather than the operational side. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, you, you touched we touched on uh, a couple of things last last month around you know data protection and you know where we do it and how we classify it and those kind of things. I think you know from the point of view of backup, right? Well, obviously, you know, we're we're talking here about you know multiple methods within three six five for. You know, whether that's archiving data for long-term storage to free up space and other things. Um, you know, I remember Alex Taylor on, on the call last time was talking about just actually how do you get to grips with how much storage you've got, right? You know, I think one of the things that we've started seeing now is a Microsoft and, and other vendors, of course, becoming a little bit stricter on how they actually enforce some of the the, the data protection, so the data storage limit within those, 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 those areas. No one really ever thought about running out of space when they started using Teams. It was just kind of, you just, because Microsoft kept increasing the limits and, and those kind of things. But I've seen now, you know, we've got so much data and, you know, as we move more things into, into cloud, then, you know, are we literally just picking everything up that we've currently got, which could be years of stuff that's not been cleansed, that may be irrelevant, and just you know picking it up from our on-premises file servers or hosted file services and dumping it into you know SharePoint or Azure Files or you know somewhere else. Um, so, and then of course we're talking about how we back it up, right? So, so not only are we moving data from locations that have relatively had a you know a very low operational cost, right? Because we've invested in that storage and we've we've, we've had things on them and we've got you know churning disks and things that might be end of life. Um, and we're now putting, you know, more things into pay-as-you-consume type storage. And then we're backing it up probably into more pay-as-you-consume storage. Um, so, Dave, what's, you know, from as someone that's kind of, you know, been going through that, going through that, how, how, do, we, how do we ensure that, we're, that we're, we're, we're only really keeping data that we need to keep versus data that we don't need to keep? And, of course, that also plays into the governance story around if, you, if you've, you know, should you keep it for too long? Can you keep it for too long? And if you need to keep it for too long, then you've got to back it up. Yeah, it's a difficult one. I think from my point of view, I th the only way to really do that is to talk to the data owners. Um, we're, we're actually going, as you're quite rightly pointed out, we're going through that process at the moment using Azure files uh, for a lot of our data. Um, and in an ideal world, I'd have, yeah, we'd have had a lot of time allocated across the business to be able to assess the data really, you know, go back over 50 years worth of data that we've got and sitting on some of our file servers. Um, obviously, a lot of that was digitized rather than, uh, you know, being traditional files, but it, it was brought from tape, physical tape in the 70s and 80s even. So we've got that type of data. And in an ideal world, do we need to keep it? You know, we'd have got to the business to make those decisions. Um, yeah, I'm balancing risk at the moment. So, you know, I've got aging on-prem file servers. Uh, this is right. The disks and the support are going to go end of life on those at some point in the future um so you have to balance that between moving it to the cloud um 
and trying to optimize the, the cost model and risk model as much as possible with that um, and balancing that with the, t the business needs to operate on all the other projects they've got to do. And yeah, let's be honest, you know, can you manage your archive of data? You've got, you know, however many terabytes of data. Can you go through that and tell me what you need to keep and what you don't? It's never going to be the top priority uh, when business have got commercial activities and research to do. Um, so it, it's a it's a risk based approach, and I, you know, myself and the team are having to just work through that and try and understand uh, the risk and balance in that um, with the, the migration to Azure files and and using third party tools with it. It uh, it's not an easy one. Um, if I'm honest, I suspect that I'm going to make upset somebody. I'm going to be very protective of data, but you know the data isn't going to be quite where they expected it to be. Um, but it's yeah, we've got to move on. We've got to make that make that a business priority, and we are. And then, and then, if you think about then, you know, the the, the trust aspect of it, right? So you know, trust falls into a, into a number of areas. It, tr it it falls into how well we trust our employees, and of course, of course, we all trust our, our employees until we don't. Um, that we've got trust in, you know, in the platform that we're, where we're trusting our data to be stored, right? So, so in the case of Cruises Five or Azure, that, that that that's Microsoft across, you know, the various different levels. So we need to understand actually, you know, what their SLAs are around, you know, both availability of the service, right, which is one aspect of of of, of data loss, I guess, even though it might be temporary, and of course data loss as well, right? So in you know catastrophic output, um, we've then also got, of course, who do you trust? For the data that you're, oh, no, sorry, we've lost Aiden. I hope I didn't upset him. Um, we, we then also got, of course, um, you know, data loss and, and data trust from the from where we're storing that data, right? So if we're backing that data up on premises, like like we used to be, we've got to have an element of trust and again security and governance in 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 the data we've got, um, and also in the cloud vendor if we're using a cloud vendor to back up, which may also be the same, right? So you might be backing up through five data to Microsoft or, or a platform that's using Microsoft, or you might choose to back that up to a completely separate cloud vendor um, so that you've got, you know, eggs in multiple baskets. So um, so how do we how do we apply that trust game, Dave? Um, and where's our data? It's a very difficult one. I, I think it, traditionally, Thatcher Research has always taken the view that um, the likes of Microsoft and other big cloud providers are uh, better skilled, better suited to to manage you know, exchange mailboxes, um, you know, all the other bits of Office 365 that come with that. So we've always taken the view that Microsoft are better equipped to do that. Um, and in my experience, um, 10 years pre Office 365 um, or BPOS as it was then, um, with us managing exchange data stores and doing defragging of the databases and all those scary things that we used to do on the weekends, um, you know, we've been very happy with it and it's, it's done what we need. Yes, there have been a few outages, um, but we, we have to accept those, I think, in this modern world that you are going to get those. We see it with telephone systems, we see it with cloud providers, and it's just, you know, a fact of life these days. Um, it, it happens to the big, biggest companies in the world. So, um, but trust is, is a key thing. And for me, it's always that balance between trying to, as you say, not put all your eggs in one basket and trying to have multiple options, multiple ways of having that reassurance and governance. Aiden, I'm not sure how much of that you you, you caught. We were just talking about um, the, the trust aspect, right, of, of you know, you're, you're trusting your data in a cloud provider that you're storing things in, so, you know, Microsoft, for example. Um, I mean, have you also got trust around actually where is your backup, right? And and, and in some cases, the, the trust of backup is as important or more important than the trust the environment that you're actually operating from in the first place. Have you got any thoughts on that? You might be struggling your connection there, Aiden. Could you survive without it, really? Um, I, I suppose, uh, I suppose it's Dave. Hello? Yeah? No? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Things are a little bit of lag on your end, I think. Can you hear I me? Think, right? I, think, I think your dog's on the Xbox again. <laughs> So 
Exchange is the, probably the prime example of kind of how many people's business runs on email and how much faith do you put in Microsoft versus running your own farm and your own data center with your own physical connections. Um, I think in the grand scheme of things, um, if you look at the infrastructure you would generally have to build out, um, either on premise or um, even in a private cloud to run your own exchange farm these days, it's kind of, yeah, you're putting a, it's not, it's not, it's not fast before you're into sort of the 50 to 100k territory. If you're going to do a fully redundant solution and, and kind of easily across kind of a couple of physical sites with, a bunch of physical servers and then you get into all the sort of physical disk you need i mean it, it rapidly mounts up if you want something fully redundant versus you can buy that off the shelf as part of your microsoft licensing um and i think from a cost benefit versus trust issue i'd probably put more faith in them running a big in a big redundant exchange farm uh than than i would uh, i was doing it on premise really to be honest and that's that's one of the key criteria there is um because they've got their reputation on the line as well I'm not saying that, they, I mean, as Dave said, it's not, not saying that nothing ever happens. I mean, you look and it's kind of, there's been a couple of authentication blips and things like that, where <laughs> if you can't sign in, you can't use the service. Uh, so it's fairly fundamental. But um, I, I think you've, you'll have seen that across all the major cloud, cloud providers yeah. over the last sort of couple of years. And uh, whilst they strive for as much uptime as possible, there is always the danger of something happening with change. Um, we took the decision sort of cost benefit wise, it was better to sort of move away from on-premise exchange in particular to go to 365 um, a good few years ago. Um, we, we, we did bounce back down on-premise and back up again uh, for a migration, uh, which, which is why I know exactly how much it can cost uh, <laughs> and uh, how much planning goes into running your own rhythms of farm on-premise. But um, uh, we're, we're back, we, were, we were back in 365 after a temporary move uh, into a different tenant. Um, and that that's something we, we probably would never move away from, I wouldn't have thought. Um, whilst we do back it up with a third party, that's more for, um, I suppose, having a full separate copy of it. It's not, I wouldn't be expecting that. To, that I suppose that's your worst case scenario in, in a different sort of infrastructure entirely sort of model, not really an operational support or um, maintenance sort of model of keeping it up, which we put faith in Microsoft to do. And yeah. I mean, I'm not saying there aren't other op other alternatives out there from Google and things like that, but kind of from our perspective and our fit, then um, Microsoft Microsoft made more sense to us. And 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 do you think so? So so I guess two other bits I wanted to pick up on um, before we before we close today, which is I'm interested in your thoughts on is is you know if if we think about you know every form of storage that that, that we have, right? So in the days where we used to buy mobile phones with very small amounts of storage on them, we were very particular about you know deleting our photos and removing apps and, and all this kind of stuff whereas now nowadays typically you buy a phone it's got so much that i never delete anything on my phone right they take bigger pictures higher resolution bigger videos i never delete anything um get a new phone um and, it, and, it, and the way that we you know of course we're working in cloud right we're creating and we always have been creating more data i mean you always read these stats there's more data created in the last two years than there was in the history of data ever existing right but that continues to evolve and of course, because we're creating more data, we're having to back up more data, right? So if we're going down this model of backing data up, um, not only is our cost of storage increasing on what we're using, presuming that those what we get as part of our bundle doesn't increase in, in, in line with demand, um, we're putting more and trusting more into those backup products if we're using backup. Um, so that, that was kind of the first I guess the, the the comment point I wanted to raise, and the second thing then is, you know, what, what, what's the risk of our backup, right? And you know, there's there's been there was multiple reports last year, and we'll probably share the NIST report um, around actually backups being a target, right? Because backup is seen as our insurance policy. We'll back all this stuff up, and we're kind of okay if anything happens if we get attacked. But what happens if your backup gets attacked as part of a strategic attack? before you get attacked <laughs> so actually you come to rely on your backup particularly the case that we've seen ransomware attacks where you know organizations have attempted to recover from ransomware through backup and actually not be able to because their backups actually been infected um so i'm just keen on your your your, your thoughts on on that really both of you well i suppose um the ever-growing storage requirements of everyone <laughs> I mean, that's not stopping anytime soon. Uh, I think we've been lucky from the perspective of the data 
volume we're looking to migrate, then the cloud license um, allocations have gone up higher than we need them to do at the moment. Um, I do think, I, yeah, I do think we're going to hit the wall at some point. I think once, if we look at sort of our legacy data migration from on-premise to cloud, once we've got that out of the way and we're sort of moved across, then with the ever-growing number of teams similar to Dave uh, and SharePoint sites, then we're going to get the, hit the point where we actually sort of will we'll face the decision, do we start buying more storage or do we sort of maintain and curate what we have? Um, and that's always going to be a challenge to how much uh, engagement, shall we say, you have with your user base and your departments as to kind of how much effort they're willing to put into that. Um, I don't think we're, we're anywhere near a, a, a cost base wooden dollars billing system internally to sort of say how that's, how that's sort of shared out. But um, uh, I'm sure there will come a time at some point where you start looking at sort of saying, do you really need that? And this is, I think, being able to sort of provide a tangible cost to the end users of this is what it costs the company in that balance, it, it, it makes a much more easy conversation to them to sort of say, this is what we're paying for this. Do you really need it? And okay, you may wish to keep it for 10 or 15 years, but what did you legally have to keep it for? And should you have sort of drawn the line there really? Um, a big one with that is kind of legacy systems where you kind of go, well, okay, I know you like the reassurance and the surety of referring to it, but the cost for this is pretty much going up every year because even if we have to take it off old hardware, containerize it, and, and keep it somehow, um, it's still an ever-increasing cost versus just pulling the data out of it and binning the system, really. Um, hey, hey, we talked a bit just, just on, that, on that point, and, and we'll, we'll come back to the, the, the how secure is our, is our backup in a moment. But you know, it, it's, you know, we, we've seen huge trends, right, of course, you know, organizations moving to cloud backup, right, whether that's cloud backup through... Um, through the native vendors or whether that's cloud backup, you know, which is actually hosted backup through somebody else. Um, given the given the challenge of, I, I guess, it, this covers security and it covers um, the, the growth in cloud, do you think there's a balance between, you know, what you would do on premises still and what you would do in cloud, both from a security and a cost control perspective? We, we, we've seen we've seen vendors. Um, you know, many of the leading storage vendors, for example, you know, announce their essentially their um, storage as a service, you know, pay as you consume type models. Um, before we've, we've got organisations with things like you know using Azure Stack, for example, to do even like Azure backup on premises, essentially. But do you think it will it will go purely cloud, or do you think it will that, that there's still a good market for that hybrid space? Is it is it the the these these traditional vendors clinging on to something to try and keep part of their traditional market or do you think it's it's cloud for good so I go? yeah, yeah. Um, essentially i think certainly on behalf of virtual i think we we're going to pretty much go as much as we can into the cloud i think uh, there is some practical and logistic reasons why we will still need on-prem services um just because of the type of nature of work we do there is you know, unless the internet pipes get crazily big, crazily soon, it's just not going to happen. So we're always going to need some level of storage, some level of resilience on-prem. Um, but we're very much, you know, into into the cloud. Um, and I think it, there will be a hybrid. It will be a mixed approach. But uh, it, cloud first is is the, the term we use, and uh, that, that's the approach we take. Um, and just just to go back to Aidan's point a little bit, I just wanted to, you know, I think it's a, an important point he raised around. You know, we've got the on-prem disks and the on-prem storage that it's very diff difficult to cost how much a department or a team's storage is going to cost. When you move into the cloud, that becomes very transparent. It is a fixed cost per month for that amount of storage. And I think that actually brings it to the front uh, and makes it more transparent to our users and our, our teams across the business as to what sort of uh, cost implication that has for that sort of level of governance and backup resilience. And do you think it promotes just get job done um, more? So, so because because you've got this ability to not, you know, I I, I remember working with organisations again, you know, y years ago where, you know, that 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 job of you know helping them cleanse data because there wasn't budget to go and buy a load more racks of, of disc or, or or load more tapes, uh, tape loads and things. Um, whereas now we are just creating data, like right? we just we create stuff all the time. We do what we need to do, and we don't really need to think about really storage, right? You know, 
email used to be something you know i remember working in the education sector many years ago and um you know we were talking about mailboxes of you know megs inside these and you know you you know you get frustration from teachers and, and things sitting there trying to manage their mailbox to clear out you know 20 30 meg of of, of email content and stuff whereas now we don't really worry about it right we've got pretty much uh, yeah, pretty much unlimited space if you include you know the, the the archiving and other kind of things that we get um but that does of course you know continue to creep up that opex cost right of actually we need to have an element of predictability of what our growth is going to be so we can contain and and report on cost and i guess that does come back to um you know controlling controlling the growth and life cycle of data um i i would challenge that slightly robin i think it depends on what your licensing model is because uh, the f SKUs from microsoft for example do have a two gig mailbox so for some people that's a very small mailbox and uh, and is still sort of quite a big task to sort of maintain and um and sort of monitor your usage of that really um specifically for frontline workers really um I think I suppose to, to go back to the sort of full cloud or full on-premise or the hybrid in between. I think similar to Dave, uh, as and where we can, we're, we'll go cloud first, and uh, we'll look to that approach. And I think I think the generic generic trend across the industry is such of that because inherently the pricing they're sort of putting forward at the moment is is cheaper to go to one of the big three providers than buy the tin and run it yourself internally generally. Um, especially when you put any sort of staffing overhead and management on that, not that that goes away entirely, because um, <laughs> if you're, uh, if you, it depends. I mean, it depends which of the sort of uh, infrastructure platform or uh, applications as a service, which, which which one you're picking. It's kind of you can easily spend as much time maintaining a virtual VM state fleet in the cloud than you can in the on-premise data centers, but um, there's less, a lot less uh, reliance on management of the physical tin and all the sort of supply chain elements around that to make sure that. Um, stuff is staying up on the hardware side of things. Um, and I know for some regulatory agreements, uh, some sectors, uh, I mean, what was, the, what, was the, what was the big example? Gambling. <laughs> Gambling was the big example of kind of like, if you're a bet fair running your data, your data centers out of a certain company, then, country, then uh, they generally tend to use your stuff inside that uh, <laughs> legal jurisdic jurisdiction. And similarly, uh, it was some of the, uh, the high-end medical stuff uh, just because of some of the uh, processing requirements that you kind of, yeah. there's a cost benefit, you kind of always saw the kind of like, well, would you really do that in the cloud or would you be paying a fortune for it? But I mean, there is always the benefit of turning it on, doing a huge bit, bit of processing and then turning it off again. You just don't get that scale up levels on, on premise. I think with with pay as you could consume on storage, it's, it's a bit more interesting because you kind of go, Okay, that's that, that. That is that level where you can do. You've got a bit more flexibility on premise, but you're still paying for power. You're still paying for racks and racks in a data center somewhere. You're still paying for kind of all the connectivity to do it. And you kind of go, is is that a level where you kind of go, could I abstract that cost from my business and still get a good level of service out of a big cloud provider instead? I'd argue you probably could. Yes. Um, I mean that being said. Some of the stuff you kind of go operationally, the, the cost and time scales to unpick that, it's always going to be a gradual stepping stage journey. It's not going to be a big bang thing just because of the cost of it. But I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who kind of go, well, if I had three data centers, actually, could I do two and back up to the, do, do a third to the cloud? Or could I, could I go down to one with uh, two cloud data centers? Or even if your redundancy is kind of like, uh, you're getting that sort of much, I suppose, technology step change of actually having sort of some of the, I suppose some of the big virtualization players who would have totally been, no, I'm on-premise only. I only do on-premise products to suddenly kind of go, oh, no, we need to facilitate you so you can flip mm -hmm. from on-premise to the cloud at the drop of a hat. You, you're starting to see that stuff coming through. And, um, well, I mean, I don't know. I suppose in, in the Microsoft land, I, I probably would have, uh, having having had experience of Hyper-V 2008 and 2012, uh, I think I, I'd never have touched 2008 after learning the lessons the hard way. But 2012 onwards, you kind of go, you've got a good, big, stable product there. So you kind of go, how, how different is it to sort of running your own Hyper-V cluster in on-premise to sort of running in Microsoft's Azure instead, you know? And um, I, I guess final question really to, to go through. We, we, we've covered, you know, we've covered, I, I think, some good, some good ground today. I think it's been, uh, you know, I, I think probably for me, it's a, uh, it's a, there's not a one size fits all. Right? I think it's, I think cloud, you know, I think both of you, you know, cloud first tends to be the approach. I, I'd echo that, that I think that's, that's generally, um, what we see. I mean, you're both relatively advanced on your on your cloud journey. I think for a lot of organisations, especially more the traditional um, 
organizations, there is still uh, a huge amount of on-premises information and, and therefore, you know, back up to cloud for them is still probably a hybrid model uh, in the short term. But I expect that to, as their migration into cloud happens, I expect backup migration into cloud will probably follow follow along along soon. I think I think the other bit that we touched on was when it was really about, you know, you know, it's just we've touched on trust, we've trust on responsibility, we've trust on the, you know, the changing shift between the owners, the owners and the owners and creators of data for shifting from IT to, to user and, and kind of business level. Um, but the other bit I wanted to just pick up on was was the clarity, right, of of you know as as people and teams of people that work with 365 um sort of every day is it is it clear do you think on actually what levels of protection you get across each uh each service within microsoft you know whether that's a per user or a total level of stuff is it clear what you've got and how that changes um and, and what would you what would you ask right for any of any of the cloud vendors out there that are you know promoting that their services are you know offering their financially slas and and all the various different levels of protection um, what would be your ask, you know, I guess, of your partners or of, of, of the vendors? Aiden, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, I suppose at the moment you have the, the depth of the technical detail in the service level agreements. Um, I think it would be, I, I don't think enough is done to sort of lay it out very clearly in a, if it's not in a half a page, which, um, as, as one of my colleagues would say, if it's not in half a page when my 80 year old mother could understand it, it's too complicated. So, for an end user perspective, it kind of I think there's there's a big journey sort of still from the hey your SLA is whatever else and it's buried in the terms and conditions and down in the details. I think invariably as a department you end up sort of recutting that and sort of saying this is what we support the end users to sort of give them that clear sort of thing of a here's where you go to or even who you ring if yeah you've deleted your file halfway through making it or whatever else or uh, it's, it, I suppose it, it's that mindset shift because even the shared creation thing where you kind of go suddenly you're in SharePoint and your version history and you're OneDrive and you've got version histories and you might have five people editing the file at the same time. That mindset just isn't there from the end user who's used to sort of traditionally working on file, file servers on premise and they have one file and the email shared copies of it around. If you're not getting that kind of adoption message out there as to kind of this is the way you could be doing things now or this is the way you should be doing things now, now some of the back end systems have changed. Um, and I, I I suppose my challenge to the sort of uh, to the Microsofts or the other big vendors of the world would be: you need to have that story to give, so we can take that in easily and provide that to our users easily. Because otherwise, we end up making it, and you kind of go, "Okay, some of it will always be a bit customised to you because you may have chosen to implement things in a certain way." But I, I challenge them: there needs to be better guidance, really, for for staff to sort of say. This and, and and I would say Microsoft are pretty good with custom learning pathways and stuff like that. So there is a lot of stuff there, but you kind of go, this is the stuff where someone's going to be panicking because it's all gone a bit peak tong and it's all gone. <laughs> they're not going to be. They're not ringing up if they if they've lost the file they've worked on for four days. They're not ever going to be ringing up in a calm state to ask about it. So it needs to be as clear and as simple as possible. And ideally, you need to have told them ahead of time. Dave. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think you're absolutely right there. I think the. The only other bit I'd like to add to that, I think, is the the clarity from the cloud providers as well. I think, just from my own experience, you know, the, all the big cloud providers are bringing on services and resilience and geo redundancy and all those things, and they're changing that uh, that technology, that infrastructure on a a monthly, yearly basis. Um, so, just from our point of view, when we were looking at Azure Files as an example, you know, we. We were there was lots of different options for resilience, lots of different options for um, backup, recovery, um, caching abilities, and all that. But you know, it was very difficult for my engineers to work that out. So you know, Microsoft are very good. They provided the fast track team. The fast track team have advised us on how to do it and the different options. But even the fast track team has said, you know, you can do it three different ways. So you know, trying to pick which one of those three ways is right for us is is always going to be a balance. But you know, I just think. If we could get some clarity and some better guidance at a high level, that would really help us. And if it helps us, I'm sure it'll help lots of others. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. And, and I think, you know, the, the point you made, Aidan, on, on, on adoption is key to so many of the topics that we've talked about, you know, in this series so far of, you know, the, the, the lack of the lack of knowledge and the lack of a, the, the, the lack of knowledge, you know, inhibits adoption. Right. But 
but people need to understand and feel safe in what they're doing. And, you know, I, I know so many organisations that still, they have all these technologies um, and they still default back. You know, you still default back. Email becomes the default fallback because everyone's used it for, I always say 30 years, it's more than that now. Um, but everyone's used email for so long. And you still get, you know, even internally here, you know, we will be, we do a huge amount of collaboration across, you know, Teams and SharePoint and things, but, but sometimes you get right to the end of it. I mean, of course, you know, you get that final, here's the final version that you actually want everyone to comment on and, and, and approve. And it, and it goes out on a reply to all email with a copy of the file. And you're like, oh no, like kind of what's happened. But it comes back to trust, doesn't it? If, you know, people know if they send someone to, a, a copy of something to somebody, they've got it, right? And that's a hard thing sometimes from an adoption perspective to unpick. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, certainly my advice there is, you know, you know, I think, you know, you both do as well, I know, but it's to keep beating that drum. And I think, you know, the days of giving users a training course when something new comes out every three years, which is what used to happen, you know, here's a quick walk around office 20, whatever, um, now needs to be how do you continually support users, right? So, Aiden, you touched on things like learning pathways. Lots of organizations have, um, you know, uh, client success, customer success teams, adoption specialists, whatever you kind of want to call them, just just to be that kind of place where you can you can give, you know, advice to users about how to do things rather than technical support about fixing things when they break. Because you know, as you said earlier, on, most of the time now, um, the stuff we use works, right? And if it breaks, it's almost not our job to fix it. If there's a problem with Azure AD and you can't sign into Teams like we did a couple of weeks back, actually. The most painful part of IT's job is sitting there waiting, not being able to do anything, right? You know, um, so I think you're absolutely right. Um, any, um, any any final words of, I guess, for anybody that's you know, that's recently moved to three six five, or you know, still looking at moving, I guess, more than than email. Any any kind of final words of of, of advice around, you know, how do you plan your data backup strategy? Um, I don't know. I think it's a trade-off, as Dave said. It's kind of a, you've got the you've got the on-premise hardware requirements of a uh, Jesus. I just need to move this now because otherwise I'll have to buy for, I'll have to buy another forklift upgrade to keep it in place. Yeah. Where you you know you've got other requ other financial requirements to just get it across and then sort it out afterwards. I think the the nice way of doing it is obviously if you don't have that time-bound requirement, then you can go through it and sort of say no look at the governance look at the permissions look at the look at the shares and see who should have access and do those reviews with the departments first because the more you get sort of straight before you copy across the easier it is that been said i think it's it's always going to be a mix of what works for the department because that that is a, a long time consuming road which takes a lot longer depending on the size of the organization than um, than you think it might do um and it's everyone's just kind of going i want to do my job this this is not my day job it's kind of but you kind of go it has to be part of your day job now yeah and the other thing i'd like to add is just a risk basically um do it prioritize by risk i think that's the one that's often overlooked you know um it shouldn't be who shouts or who's got the biggest data store do it by risk i think there's a lot to be said for um reviewing the assets and understanding what the risk level of all the assets are um, and taking your approach based on that Oh, um, final final point there, Rob. Um, SharePoint search. If you think you've got your permissions right and you don't have your permissions right, and you may have put something which shouldn't be shared in there to everyone, well, that might not be very visible on an on-premise file server. When you move the data up to SharePoint, it will be very visible very quickly. So uh, there is a big message to sort of uh, say this needs to be done with the internal teams, really. Yes, I, 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 I remember I remember some horrific stories from, from customers when 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 um, what was Dell kind of first insights now, isn't it? But uh, Dell when that kind of first surfaced, and I was like, oh my, what's happened? I can I can see everything. Um, you're absolutely right. You know, very, very much opens those things up. Um, anyway, um, we're just about out of time, but um, it's been an interesting, uh, interesting. I, I don't think we've kind of came to any, any any final conclusion we are um one of the things i think we're going to be doing on the back of this is just collating some of the thoughts that uh that, that, that you guys had today and also some of the panel that couldn't join us but are uh, i know hard at work and um, themselves looking at their data protection strategies so so we're going to share some of those thoughts i think in a in a in a short discussion paper on the back of this but um i'd like to thank you both um for uh, holding the thought today in, in place of everybody else. Um, I hope everyone found it useful. Um, continue to put some comments in if, if there's other things you want to understand. 
Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Adam. Thank you.